the work that I'm going to present today is the PhD work, as Natalie suggested. Uh, so this is work that I carried out and finished earlier on this year, uh, basically looking at micro CT for tissue regeneration. So this project basically comes from uh, looking at mechanobiology. So we know that tissues adapt to loads, uh, and this applies both in terms of tissue quantity. So if we're thinking of astronauts in space losing bone density due to the lack of loads applied to them, if we're looking at people like bodybuilders who are obviously putting on lots of muscle mass through lifting heavy weights, uh, but it also applies in terms of uh, problems that happen in orthopedics. So if we're thinking of stiff implants that are being implanted within the body, you lose local uh, bone density due to the stress shielding that's occurring. But it's not just the tissue quantity, it's also the type. So depending on the loads that are applied to the tissue and the types of loading, it can actually depend, it can actually drive, sorry, the uh, lineage of the cells and therefore the tissue that grows from it. So this is a big part of the work that we're looking at is in terms of the loads that are applied locally and how they affect the types of tissue that are grown. So the tissue that I'm interested in primarily is articular cartilage. And for those who aren't familiar with it, uh, it's the soft tissue that occurs at the end of all of your bones in articulating joints. So this region here is articular cartilage of the knee. Um, and it's got miraculous properties where it's very, very low friction. Uh, and it's basically extremely good at transferring loads uh, throughout your daily life uh, amongst all of your joints. The structure is very interesting as well. So this is the subcondyl bone underneath here, and that's the top surface of the cartilage. Uh, and the cells are arranged in an inhomogeneous fashion, as well as the collagen structure is quite interesting. So we'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, but what I'll also point out is that there's no blood supply within the cartilage. So one of the reasons that it's uh, had problems with healing in the past is because there's just a fusion and there's no blood supply within the tissue. So moving on to speak about injuries. So it tends to be the case that unless somebody has a very small injury, the injury tends to get worse and worse and worse over time. And it's not just elderly patients, as you might expect. So it's affecting younger patients, uh, coming from even just sporting injuries and just day-to-day -day wear that happens. Uh, it costs a load of money, of course, but also beyond that, it's a human problem. So it's causing a lot of pain and morbidity and, morbi uh, and mobility issues. Uh, so it doesn't apply for cartilage, uh, that if you have a cartilage injury, it tends to get worse and worse. It doesn't make you stronger. So please try and avoid damaging your cartilage. Moving on to the types of interventions that currently are available. Mosaic plasty is one that um, sounds like a good idea because you're basically trying to take spare tissue from around the body. So the cartilage, for example, at the iliac crest near your hips, um, and then you implant it into the area that's uh, had the damage but of course you don't have an unlimited supply of the cartilage and it doesn't repair itself very well. The most common type of uh, intervention is microfracture so this is where the surgeon will poke holes effectively in the subchondral bone which is what you can see here uh, and it's a great idea because it releases stem cells with the idea that they'll then differentiate into the uh, articular cartilage that you're trying to repair but the problem is that because there's no kind of scaffold that is just a void that it's sitting within. It doesn't instruct the cells in the correct way. So actually, it tends to be fibrocartilage that gets formed, which is much inferior. It's not low friction in the same way that uh, articular cartilage is, so it tends to only last for a year or two. And then the final one is Macy, which is an interesting idea. You're basically taking some of the surrounding tissue uh, and basically trying to grow it up in the lab with a matrix and then implant it again. Uh, the idea is good, but basically the central theme is that we, we need to have a good understanding of what's happening within the tissue in terms of the properties of it, the mechanics, to basically be able to design better implants and materials. If we don't solve the problem early, we have the late stage intervention, which is joint replacement, which is something that we should really try and avoid. Uh, it does generally do a pretty good job, uh, but they don't last forever and you still have pain. And with people living longer and longer, it's really the type of thing that surgeons are trying to put off until it's absolutely necessary. So we think that an ideal solution would be one using regenerative medicine. So it's something that we can use at the early stages while the problem's still small, before the cartilage becomes too damaged. Ideally, we'd like to be able to regenerate the tissue back to its former glory, so in this case, the articular cartilage. And then what we want to be able to do is have an implant in there that leaves no trace. It's the type of thing that it basically degrades over time. So these are nice ideas, but what we need to be able to do is basically be able to drive lineage of the cells and therefore regenerate the tissue using the appropriate mechanics within the tissue. Um, and to do this, we need to know what the local properties are, the biomechanics of the tissue. But the problem is actually that for cartilage, these really are not too well known at all. So where does imaging come into this? 
Well, in the past, people have looked at 2D techniques such as digital image correlation. So you can see here uh, a slice of cartilage, similar in a way to what you'd use for histology perhaps, or a slightly thicker slice. But you're basically looking at the exposed surface and using microscopy to take images as compression is applied. So what they're able to do is track the compression of the cells and of the tissue and from this figure out the mechanical properties. The issue though is that 2D techniques really aren't too representative of what's really going on in 3D. You've got boundary condition issues, you've got edge effects. Uh, as we saw, the collagen structure is very much 3D and there's a lot going on there. So if you're just taking the slice off the center of it, you're really not seeing what's going on you know, throughout the whole volume. As well as that, you're not able to consider more complex systems. So for example, if you wanted to look at an implant within the tissue defect, it's simply impossible if you've only got a surface technique. So people have started to try and look at the problem in 3D. So this here, for example, was a study that was carried out using clinical MRI. And the study looked at basically trying to track the deformation uh, within the cartilage in three dimensions. So they produced these plots over here. The issue though is that they were extremely low resolution, so they wouldn't be particularly good to be able to inform device design. So the technique that I've been using is called digital volume correlation. So what we're able to do is use 3D imaging. So this could be clinical CT, micro CT, MRI, techniques such as that. And what we do is we take a reference scan of the image, uh, of the tissue, I should say. So it's unloaded, so it's basically in its static state. And then we apply within the scanner some mechanical loading. So we basically squash the tissue a small amount. And then what we're able to do, uh, the most important feature is basically be able to look at the structure of the tissue or the sample uh, and have features within it we can basically track the movement of. So uh, typically this is done in bone. And within that, of course, you have porosity, you have the trabeculi, and you're able to track the features of those. Um, and people are starting to look now at soft tissue applications for this. And what you're able to do is basically uh, track the movement of the features, guess out the vectors of the displacements, and from that you can calculate the strains. And you can see here some of the plots that we've been able to get out. So you can see really rich uh, in three-dimensional uh, maps of the strain and the displacement. So the work that I've been using, uh, the work that I've been carrying out that uses DVC is mainly of these three parts. We've looked at the tissue itself, we've looked at some regenerative medicine implants, and then we've also looked at the implants and the tissue together. And all of this was carried out with a laboratory micro CT system. Uh, but to start with, like I said, we need to really have a good idea of um, the structure within the cartilage. We need to be able to image the cells within it to create a pattern that can be tracked. Uh, and as a starting point, the contrast and the image quality really is quite low usually for these solid materials where there's a lot going on, but it's very, very low contrast. So what we had to do initially was develop a technique to be able to image the cells within 3D, um, which doesn't sound too bad if you're thinking on the length scales of histology, where it's maybe, you know, 10 to 50 microns or something like that. But we wanted to see it through the whole cart uh, cartilage height, which was typically uh, two, three millimeters tall. And the cells themselves are only 10 microns or so in diameter. So it's quite a challenge to work on both those length scales at the same time. And what we did was we looked at these three millimeter diameter bovine plugs. And what we did was look across different scanning protocols and also look at the different sample preparation techniques. So we looked with and without staining. And we also looked at using different mediums, PBS and ethanol. So moving on to some of our results here. So you can see this is typically where we start off with images looking, but with some work, we were able to get them across to much more representative images of what was really going on within the cartilage. Uh, of the two different scanning protocols, we used a propagation phase uh, contrast kind of approach, which gave by far and away much better results than we would typically use for micro CT imaging. And the best images that we had were using both a stain and ethanol together. But of course, the problem with this is that it's less physiologically relevant. You know, you're doing quite a lot to the tissue. So something I'd like to comment on is that we also did work where we were looking either without staining with uh, ethanol or with staining and PBS. So we think these perhaps could be two routes that could be taken forwards uh, and be de less disruptive to the tissue. So moving on here to some of the images that we were able to collect, you can see here throughout the whole height, able to carry out all of the types of uh, analysis of the cell volumes and densities and such forth. And we also did some histology on the same sample. So we were able to look both uh, at the micro CT and then carry out histology and we're able to match the features within the two. Uh, 
Uh, I've got this video that will hopefully work. Here we go. So you can see, so this is a slice of histology. We're able to zoom in. So these are the individual chondrocytes sitting within their lacunae. And then we're able to match that with our micro CT, micro CT technique. Uh, and to give a sense here of kind of how much information we're able to get out is a full 3D volume across several millimeters compared to the single slice from the histology. Uh, something actually unrelated to the work, but we we saw it, so it might be interesting to show for some people, is that um, cartilage is typically avascular, but for these juvenile bovine samples, we saw miraculous, really dense networks of uh, cartilage canals, which, you know, are kind of blood vessels that we saw. So this is something that I'm working on at the moment, actually, to try and get this work published, because it's not really been commented on too much in the past. We didn't see this any in, in any of the human samples, uh, otherwise that would be a much more significant uh, result. So moving on now to some of the other work that we've done. So now that we had developed the uh, technique to be able to look at the cells, we now wanted to, of course, be able to apply some compression and be able to look at the tissue mechanics in 3D. So to do this, we moved across to human donors. So we had two different donors and two different samples from each. We then took, again, a three millimeter plug, but this time we loaded it into this uh, loading rig that I developed. And that meant that we were able to carry out the compression within the micro CT scanner and then we're able to carry out DVC on this afterwards. So here again is a video. So this shows the bone at the bottom, and then we've got the cartilage on top of that. So this is the first scan, and then in a second should come the second one. There we go. So in red, here is the second scan with further compression applied. And you can see here on the right-hand side some of our results that came out from it, showing uh, similar to what I showed before, the nice 3D uh, structure of the biomechanics that we can visualize. So here's the results for the individual four samples. The height here is representative of the height of the actual samples themselves. So you can see that donor A had thicker cartilage than donor B. Um, I should point out that this is, of course, a very small sample size. So something that I'd like to be able to suggest for the future is, of course, to be able to look at degradation of the cartilage, look and see how the strain maps uh, vary depending on that thickness. But you can see here, actually, that for most of them, the majority of the both, the, of course, the displacement, but also the strain tends to occur closest to the superficial zone of the cartilage. That's the top zone. So this work could be carried forwards both in terms of the work that we're looking at for uh, regenerative medicine, but it could also be useful for developmental studies, looking at how the cartilage changes over time. Um, and here we were able to carry out some um, ground truth measurements, I guess you could say. So we were comparing what we get out from the DVC with the manually calculated results. And again, we saw a uh, nice uh, correlation between the two. So moving on now. So we've looked at the tissue itself. But of course, what we're interested in is regenerating the tissue. So uh, using the group in the Department of Materials led by Professor Julian Jones, we've looked at these hybrid materials. So by hybrid, we mean that it's got both organic and inorganic phases, but they're actually bonded at the nanoscale, forming this network, working together. So it's not as if you're having like a composite, two different materials, it really is acting as one. And you can see here the impressive mechanical properties. So we've termed it bouncy bioglass. Uh, and if you want to read more about the properties of it, you can go to Francesca's, Francesca Talia's paper that's listed here. And so what we're using these materials for is uh, basically be able to design 3D printed implants with these properties that can then be matched to the local tissue. So they're degradable, which is obviously necessary for coming up with something that leaves no trace. It promotes uh, the chondrogenic lineage. And also we can tailor the properties both in terms of the 3D printing architecture, but also the ratio of the organic to the inorganic components. So they're very tailorable depending on the mechanical properties that we're after. So similar to what we did with the cartilage, we were able to put it into the micro CT scanner and apply some load. Um, and we did it on two different types of samples. So the first one that I should mention is the mechanical loading kind of one that we typically use for materials testing equipment. And we a thinner sample which is much more similar to what would actually be used in vivo. Here are some of the results. So you can see again really nicely 3D uh, maps that we're able to create from this uh, for the individual samples across different loading levels that we carried out. Um, despite the fact that it was a homogeneous structure it was really easy actually to point out from these just how inhomogeneous the strain maps were. So surface details, things that came out through the 3D printing process. Um, effectively, this is able to show us that even though we had homogeneous designs, we had actually an inhomogeneous response. 
So this is something that the team's able to use to basically be able to drive the design of the materials going forwards and basically be able to help design materials that further match the local tissue properties. We also compared it to the 2D DIC technique, so what I said about the cartilage. Uh, so this is just a surface technique and we compared that to the DVC surface and these compared quite nicely. But also, of course, we had the central slices, so we were able to get the entire volume, which gives a much, much richer view of what's going on. So moving on now to the final part of the work that I did, was we basically looked at an ovine model. So we did some in vivo testing where we were able to plant uh, implants, I should say, one of these scaffolds within a tissue defect that was created within the knee effectively of the sheep. So the intention was to have plant placed within it. And also we carried out microfracture underneath because this is, a, but we were hoping that if you have an implant that will actually drive the correct cell lineage into articular cartilage. And then after six weeks of implantation, we actually took out, carried out again, the micro CT and in situ testing. So here's some of the results that we had. Um, the first thing I'll say actually is that the surgical technique uh, went slightly wrong. So you can see here this region marked to C. This is the cartilage up there. And actually the implant itself was seen. So that's something that we uh, found within this pilot study that we were carrying out. But what was actually quite interesting is although the implant itself wasn't placed as we wanted it to, we were actually really nicely able to look at the micro motion and therefore the relative motion of the implant to the surrounding tissue. So if we come over here to the right hand side, you can see here the displacement of the tissue. So uh, sorry, it's not particularly easy to see, but here's the implant in the center of the defect. So at the lower level, lower loading pool, there's a displacement. Uh, as you'd expect, of course, because the void itself was much lower stiffness than the other components, that took the majority of the strain and less was, a, uh, how should I say it, uh, applied to the implant. I think this hopefully shows us a little bit better. You can see here the hybrids, the implant itself received most of the displacement compared to the surrounding uh, features, but then actually the void itself was the region that uh, received the most strain. So although the study itself didn't go perfectly, we think it could be a really useful technique going forwards to be able to non-destructively look at what's going on within the implant, to both look at the micro motion, but also look at the strain profiles within the implant, but also in relation to the surrounding cartilage. And now I wanted to give a brief overview of different types of tissue. So I've focused now just on articular cartilage, but the DVC technique is also being used for other soft tissues. So if we now look for a second at the IVD, the interversible disc. So this is the discs that sit within your spine. And the structure actually in a way is more complicated than cartilage because you have this nucleus pulposus, this central region here that sits in the center. And then it's surrounded by this collagen network within the annulus fibrosis. And the tissue properties are very, very different between the two. And if you can imagine, there's no way you could use a 2D technique to also look at what's going on in the center without having to very destructively slice it in half. So the team that I've worked with, led by Sam and Tavana, have carried out some MRI and basically been able to do similar to what we have with the cartilage within the micro CT, apply it more uh, physiologically, I guess you could say, to actually the whole tissue and basically be able to look at it within what's going on centrally within the nucleus um, pulposus, but also the annulus surrounding tissue. And going forwards, this is being used by Gloria Young, Dr. Gloria Young, I should say, within Julian Jones's group over in materials to be able to develop new materials that could then stand a chance of being able to match these uh, gradients that we're seeing within the interversical disc. Okay, so that's the end of the work that I'm gonna show. So in summary, we were able to develop a technique to be able to look at the chondrocytes, the cells within articular cartilage in 3D, which we think could be useful both uh, for studies to look at the biomechanics, but also could be useful for biologists who are interested in a whole plethora of other uh, technologies and techniques. We then were able to develop the 3D strain maps within articular cartilage, which is useful both for an understanding of what's going on within the tissue in 3D, but also to be able to look at designing new materials that can match those properties uh, of the cartilage.
tool technique for being able to design your implants. We've shown it on quite a basic design, but there's no reason that you couldn't take it forward to have much, much more complicated designs of implants. And then, of course, we've been able to also show it very briefly, looking at the interface between the biomaterial and the tissue. So we think this is something that could be used as part of a toolkit um, by teams of researchers who are interested in trying to develop regenerative medicine approaches that could then uh, go some way to hopefully be able to, um, you know, restore health within the population. So with that, thank you very much for listening. I'd like to thank the teams that I worked uh, with during the PhD and also the internal collaborators that I had, the external collaborators and the funding sources. Uh, and you can get in contact with me here. One final cheeky thing that I'd like to add, uh, since I've got a captive audience here, is that I've got a small website where I try and help prospective PhD students. Uh, and we are feature basically PhD researchers, so either people who are current PhD students or previous researchers. Uh, and basically try and give information to help people, give hints and tips and stuff like that. So if you've got any interest in doing that, I'd love to hear from you. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Jeff. That was great. Um, I was just going to ask if you could go, uh, I think it was three or four slides back, um, and there was two slides where the internet connection was a bit wobbly. Um, so I think people... Oh, no. Okay. Quickly ...go back over them. So um, I included this slide and potentially the one before. Which one is it? Um, actually, yeah, so the one, maybe just if you could briefly summarize um, from, from this slide, the two slides after this. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, did you say this one as well, or is it the two yeah, just following it? We've got most of this one, So, but then it was... Oh, um, okay. Slides. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry about the internet connection. Uh, so effectively, we implanted one of these implants within a tissue defect in an ovine model, and after six weeks, we carried out the DVC on it. Um, both within the implant, but also within the surrounding tissue. Uh, and so some of the results that we saw were that the tissue defects that we created was deeper than intended. So we wanted it to just be a cartilage uh, defect. So you can see here C indicating the cartilage, B indicating the bone. And the hybrid material that isn't too easily seen here, but it's highlighted here, you can see it. Um, it was actually deeper within the tissue than intended. Uh, which we thought was a bad thing at first, and certainly it's not good for actually regeneration, but it was an interesting test of the technique to be able to see that we could actually track the displacement and therefore the relative micromotion of the implant. So you've got two different ways of looking at the same data effectively here. So in 3D, you can see what's going on to the different components of the system. So we've got the bone over here and the cartilage, and then I agree it's not great, it's not very easy to see, but you've got the implant basically sitting within the defect here and we're able to look at the displacement of the different regions. So you can see most of the displacement occurring in the void effectively around the implant, the same as the strain actually being the highest. But at the second loading level is perhaps best seen over here. You can actually see most of the displacement is occurring to the actual hybrid implant. So it didn't go perfectly, but it was a useful test of the system to be able to see that we were able to track the relative micromotion of the implant. Uh, so hopefully that answers it slightly better. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Would you have to <laughs> quickly go to the next slide as well? Yeah. Um, so I think we missed the start of this one. If that's oh, good. okay. And we got uh, the, the rest of it. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, people are also looking at other types of soft tissue for these types of techniques. So interversible discs are one of the main ones. So it's got a very complicated structure. So it's got a nucleus pulposus in the center, which is very different to the structure of the edge. So with 2D techniques, you would simply never be able to look at what's going on within the whole tissue structure such as this, unless you very destructively cut it in half, which of course is going to destroy, uh, you know, kind of the hoop stress that's going on within the region at the edges. Uh, and then I should say, of course, that there were groups looking at these types of tissues and have used MRI to carry out the study that was published earlier on this year. Uh, and we're taking it forwards with Dr. Gloria Young to be able to design new materials that are using these types of mechanical properties and be able to look at the strain gradients that's occurring between the different regions to then be able to match those with new tissues, uh, with new uh, materials, I should say. Perfect. Thank you so much for repeating that. I will oh, also be for the recording <laughs> as well. Um, so we've had a few questions. Uh, the first one from Pedro. He said, very interesting, Jeff. I think development of imaging techniques like this will help a lot. Maybe I missed it, but I was wondering if you have validated this with other techniques, such as nano indentation. That was one of my questions too. Um, so I'll let you answer that first. 
Yep. Uh, so nano indentation, we had actually started just as lockdown was starting to happen. So it was very badly timed uh, because we completely agree that having other types of mechanical techniques as validation would be fantastic to be able to do. Uh, we did also carry out, I think I included it for at least a couple of the different techniques. We did some ground truth kind of validation against basically a manual uh, calculated strain. So this was something that we we're able to do manually. So we agree, of course, it's not ideal because it's just another imaging technique rather than actually mechanical. Uh, but it goes some way, I think, to at least showing that what we're seeing is realistic. But we agree completely that other types of validation techniques are necessary for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, he also asked, what was the resolution of the characterization of the mechanical properties? And then he's put, um, I'm thinking now of the interface between bone and cartilage being just approximately 50 microns. Yeah. Um, so for the micro CT scanning, it's always a trade-off of obviously having high resolution, but also being able to see across the, the space that you're trying to look at, the volume of interest. So for most of these, we're using around two microns resolution. Um, and so the DVC technique, basically, you can apply some optimization to figure out basically the size of each of the boxes that you want to be able to, be able to track. Uh, so typically, I'd say maybe it's like 100 micron resolution for those DVC outputs, but you could certainly optimize it further and bring it down to maybe 30, 40, 50. So around the size of the interface, I would say, something like that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then Alexander has asked a question. Hi, Jeff. Very cool work. What is the approximate computational time for determining the volumetric strain on an osteochondral pug of that of that size? So. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, typically, maybe half an hour, something along that kind of length scale. If you're running something with many, many passes, kind of many iterations, it can last maybe overnight. So the times that I'd you know click go and then come back in the morning, it would be finished. But at most, I'd say probably an hour or two, something like that, typically. So not too bad. Mm -hmm. And I had quite a naive question um, for the bioglass. I was wondering why do you want it to be degradable considering there's a very low regenerative capacity of cartilage in patients? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, something that I didn't include actually is that there's two permutations. So the uh, implant that we were looking at mostly for the cartilage was degradable, but Gloria Young's one where she's starting to look at the interversible disc, that's actually for a tissue replacement. So it's not degradable. Uh, so it's very easy to just, you know, choose what you're after. But answering why we want it to basically degrade, we're thinking that with the microfracture, you're able to release the stem cells to the area and we're hoping that would actually speed up what would typically take much, much longer for the body to do naturally on its own if it doesn't have that kind of surge of activity within the region. Uh, but certainly you're still looking on the length scale of kind of months for regeneration to occur. Um, and we're hoping, of course, that the tissue would regenerate at a similar kind of length to the implant degrading. But that's something that's going to take slightly more fine tuning, of course, to perfect. But it's a really good question. And can the bioglass be combined with kind of any agents that would promote regeneration yeah so uh it's not something that i've got particular expertise in but there's a lot of researchers within professor jones's group who are looking at different agents and things that you can attach to it uh nano and other types of things that could be used actually as kind of providing further either promotion of different things going on or it can inhibit uh, depending on of course what it is that you're after so yeah there is a lot of scope to be able to tailor it to whatever application you're after excellent Cool. Um, and uh, just a few extra questions whilst I wait for any of this to come through in the, the chat group. Um, although obviously some of it was a, a pilot based study, but did, would you expect or have you observed any differences in the properties of the cartilage depending on where in a joint it's been taken? Uh, it's kind of too early to say in terms of what we've seen, but certainly you're right that from previous studies, people have noticed that depending on where you're taking the samples from there can be vastly different. And also I've noticed myself that the thickness of the cartilage varies enormously. So if you're taking it slap bang in the middle of the condyle, somewhere along here, it's much, much thicker than if you're taking it at the periphery uh, or any other kind of region. So yeah, you would expect the properties to be quite different. So I think it's probably optimistic to expect that you can come up with like the gold standard, you know, one set of mechanical properties that would be matching every kind of situation. Um, and it's something that I kind of would have liked to have been able to explore further because we were very lucky with the biomechanics group to have access to a huge number of cadaveric samples. So we could have, or could in the future, I should say, uh, 
look at kind of degradation and look across different ages and BMIs and such forth. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and then one last question I had just out of interest. Um, has it been possible to know what the physiological forces that are the cartilage is subjected to and how is that um, compared to the compression you're exerting during the imaging? Yeah, it's another good question. So people have tried to do studies like that. It's of course very different, difficult, I should say, in vivo to try and you know look at the forces in that way. But actually, rather than the forces, what's much easier to do is just look at the strain, so the deformation that's applied. Uh, so typically, you'd expect cartilage to be able to cope up to around twenty percent strain, which is similar levels to both what we applied for the cartilage and also for the hybrid implants that we were designing. Uh, so that's something that's kind of readily known as a strain level. Excellent. Thank you.